Hello everyone, I welcome you all to another video by Legacy IS where we are going to discuss a comparison between the constitutions of India as well as the United States of America. India has basically framed its constitutions by borrowing a lot from the constitutions of the world including United States of America. Now we are going to actually have this discussion today to understand the similarities that are there between the principles of the two constitutions, the differences that are there and even the principles which have been borrowed, how they have been borrowed and with what amount of customization have they been borrowed and used in the Indian system. Keeping that perspective in mind will actually help us understand the future relations. It will help us understand the nature of the political system and the society. And obviously, it will help us appreciate that there can be differences between two friends and strategic partners. So keeping that perspective in mind, let us begin our discussion of India and US constitutions, a comparison between the two constitutions. Now, if we look at the features which are particularly borrowed from the US constitution, we have firstly the fundamental rights something so primary to the Indian constitution that we have a discussion whereby we are concentrating on giving so much attention to these particular rights whose origin began from the Bill of Rights. The independence of judiciary. Now in the United States there is a system of separation of powers and also checks and balances. The kind of strict division that is there in the United States is not present in India, but nevertheless, judiciary gets that kind of separation from the executive and the legislature in that sense, and that amounts to independence of the judiciary. Judicial review is also something that is extremely important in India. It forms a part of the basic structure of the constitution and something that is held very significant by the judiciary. We also have provisions with regards to the way in which the president is impeached in both the countries and we have borrowed that principle from the United States of America. With regards to the removal of the judges of the Supreme Court and the High Court, we have the Indian constitution borrowing principles from the United States, the procedure. Of course, the uh, reasons are basically kind of different, but then the procedure is where there is some similarity and there has been some influence of the US constitution upon the Indian constitution. With regards to the post of the vice president as well, we see a lot of influence and borrowing of principles as the chairman. In India, the vice president is the chairman of the upper house or the Rajya Sabha, the ex official chairman. Right? So these are the features which the Indian constitutions have borrowed from United States of America and have been greatly influenced. We also have an understanding whereby we have some similarities between the two constitutions. Now to begin with the similarities, we both our countries have a written constitution. Ours is of course one of the lengthiest constitution of the world and theirs is definitely one of the oldest. But both of us have a written constitution and that is essential primarily because we are trying to have supremacy of the federal or the union government and or rather the whole system of sharing of powers is possible when you have a written document mentioning the nature of powers that is being shared between the central and the state. We also discussed how Bill of Rights and Fundamental Rights are something that are influenced and also taken from the United States of America. I just also talked about how separation of power is also something that we are influenced by but have not completely taken the way in which it is practiced in the United States of America. We will also touch upon that when we do the systems of government. Also, checks and balance is something which tries to maintain a healthy equilibrium in the entire government system, something again which we've been influenced. And we have a certain amount of these checks and balances which each organ of the government exercises 
upon each other. In fact, uh, the different constitutional bodies also exercise upon each other. For example, the Election Commission of India, all right, and the judiciary. So the different constitutional and non-constitutional bodies also enjoy and exercise some amount of checks and balances. But when we come to the differences which lie between the two countries, we start from the nature of the constitution with the United States, the shortest and India, the longest. All right. So the lengthiest constitution of India was actually something that has gone through a lot of amendments, additions and subtraction and stands tall today as the lengthiest constitution of the world. One thing which is very important is the fact that the US constitution, though small, is extremely rigid in terms of how stuck they are, how fixed they are to its provisions and principles. And we've only have seven articles consisting of 27 amendments so far. All right. Some amendments are in the view, but overall, at least 27 have been made so far. But if you look at the Indian number, we have almost 100 plus amendments which have come to force till today. So we do have a system whereby we've tried to make the constitution much more dynamic. All right, which makes it relevant and stands the test of time and which is why this provision of amendments have been incorporated and successfully 100 plus amendments have been made so far, which only shows that A, it's possible and B, we've stood the test of time through these amendments and evolved and adapted according to the changing scenario. Moreover, the United States became a federal republic by having an adoption of its constitution in 1789. So it was symbolized or the entire constitution, the state is being recognized as a federal republic state. Whereas if you look at India and you have to define the nature of the Indian constitution or the state for that matter, we refer to India as sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic and republic, which is how it's mentioned in the preamble as well. So we have much more distinct specified ways in determining what is the nature of our constitution. Now, as far as the differences between US and India are concerned, we are also different in the way in which history has guided us and brought us to this present form of government. As far as US is concerned, it was basically formed almost by a consensus whereby the states agreed to begin become the United States of America, they agreed to come together and form this present country that you see today. So it's like in the indestructible union of indestructible states, which means that neither the states can be destroyed nor the entire union can be disturbed. All right. However, in India, we have indestructible union of destructible states. This is a major difference in terms of how these two countries have been organized, the nature of a federation that is there in the country, the kind of relationship that is there between the center and the federating units, the sharing of power and the upper hand that the center always has, especially in the Indian scenario. In United States of America, all states are given equal representation in the Senate and making it a much more symmetrical federation, treating everyone as equal. However, if we look at India, the states are given representation primarily on the basis of their population. So there will always be a very big difference between, let's say, an Uttar Pradesh and a Maharashtra, Visavi, a Goa and a Sikkim, because the population is varied in, in those terms. We also have differences in terms of the way in which the governments the, uh, of the two nations are organized with one being parliamentary and the other being presidential. Now, in a presidential form of a government, we essentially have the people who directly elect the executive president. All right. And here, this kind of direct election makes the position of the president extremely powerful. And hence, he is not accountable to the House of Congress because of this direct election. In India, however, we have a parliamentary form of a government where the executive is a part of the legislature and the executive is accountable to the lower house of the parliament. Here, if we speak of the president, he's the executive head of the Indian Union, but he's indirectly elected 
by the people, by the legislators of the center as well as the state. And like the US president, he's not accountable to the parliament. Now we also have difference in terms of the way in which the parliament in India is or the legislature is in both the countries. So in India, the lower house or the Lok Sabha is much more powerful and its members are directly elected by the people. This representation is on the population strength. So the lower house is a true representative or stands tall as a symbol of democracy through direct representation on the basis of the population that is there. In the United States, however, we have the House of Representatives elected on the basis of population similarly, but irrespective of the size of the state or its population, each state in the US have only two Senate members, which goes on to say that here population is the one determining the number of seats or the number of representation. However, in the case of United States, there is a fixed number and a symmetry is being maintained. We also see that while in the Lok Sabha or in the lower house, it is more powerful in the case of India. All right. If you look at the Senate, that is more powerful in the case of the United States. So member of the upper house or the Rajya Sabha in India, they are indirectly elected. All right. Whereas if you look at United States, it is directly elected and Rajya Sabha member is either indirectly elected through a system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote. So we have a difference in terms of the method, the population criteria, and that also kind of gives different kinds of importance to the Indian parliamentary systems vis-a-vis the US parliamentary system. If we look at the eligibility that is required for any person to become a president in US Visavi India, in the United States, if you only have a natural born citizen, only that person is eligible to become a president, not someone who has acquired citizenship. All right. The other eligibilities are in terms of age, 35 years of age and staying in US for at least 14 years. If you look at India, the Indian president should be a citizen of India. All right. The methodology of acquiring that citizenship is not essential. It can either be natural or be acquired. We also see that the US constitution, essentially when we speak of the tenure of the president, we have a specific fixed date and timing of the retirement of the president. All right. So it is essentially fixed to be held in the month of November. And in the same month, that is in November itself, results are also announced. So elections and results are fixed to be held every, uh, every tenure in the month of November. However, in the case of India, you have a president's death, resignation or impeachment. You have the vice president serving that period. There is no fixed time, no certainty like you have in the case of United States in terms of the election of the president. We also have some differences in way in which the position of the president is there in the United States Visavi India. So if we look at the American president, he stays in office for a term of four years, whereas the Indian president stays in office for five years. All right. So a president of the United States can hold office of the presidentship only for two terms. But in India, for any number of terms, you can have the president the same person as the president of India. This president is independent of the administration in the United States, but directly responsible to the people of United States. However, in India, we have the president running the government with the aid and advice of the Council of Minister. There is no direct accountability to the public for that matter, because there is no direct election in that sense. Of course, he stands to serve the public, but nevertheless, the kind of accountability which lies in the case of United States of America is not there for India. The US president actually does not address the legislature. Moreover, he cannot dissolve the legislature as well. So under the US constitution, the president may respond to a bill by three ways. When a bill is presented to the president, he may sign the bill, he may veto the bill or absolutely do nothing. 
Now, if he chooses to do choose a third option, that means he does nothing, then the bill automatically becomes a law after a period of 10 days. But if the president vetoes a bill, the Congress can still enact it in order to make a law by passing the measure by two-thirds majority. So this majority actually allows the Congress to bypass the president veto. In India, however, we have different kinds of vetoes like suspensive veto, which allows the president to send the bill back for reconsideration. Such kind of provisions are not there in the US constitution. So there is also no particular time limit that is being prescribed within which the president is bound to sign the bill. We also see difference in terms of the impeachment of the president. So as far as India is concerned, the grounds for impeachment lie in the violation of the constitution. However, in the United States of America, basically the violation, the impeachment takes place if there is violation on and there is uh, treason on the part of the person who is holding that position. There is bribery and there are high crimes of misdemeanor. And these kind of add up to the entire character, the priority with the US president is supposed to uplift or stand by. We finally have the judicial system whereby we see that in the US, the judicial system is much more advanced as far as the Indian judicial system, which is still rapidly developing. Here in India, we also have an integrated judiciary which is not something that is present in the United States. Here, the Supreme Court in India has much wider powers, including appealing jurisdiction or appellate jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters. This kind of appellate jurisdiction is not present in the Supreme Court or before the Supreme Court of United States of America. We also have some additional areas of difference, which includes the Residuary powers, the center basically has the residual powers in the case of India. But if you look at the United States, the different states, the individual federating units are the ones who have the residuary powers. This is again an important difference which kind of shows the relationship that is there between the center and state. In, the, in India essentially, it is the center which kind of has a final power in terms of a lot of uh, the say and lawmaking that happens in the country to the extent that in the absence of or rather in violation of any of the directives of the center, the center can actually impose precedence rule in the state. All right. So in that sense, the center really has an upper hand in a lot of situation. Moreover, India is known for single citizenship. So the uh, if you look at the entire system that is there in India vis-a-vis -vis United States, we are symbolized by single citizenship. Whereas in US, there is a citizenship that is for the center or the federal and one for the individual states. So there is allegiance to both the country as well as to the state that you belong to. In India, if we do that, we are formed from a time whereby the states did not want to come and form the Indian Union. In fact, uh, even given a choice today, we fear that a lot of states might want to secede from the Indian Union. We don't want that situation to happen and hence we have these phase safeguards in terms of citizenship. Moreover, the Indian states actually are not the ones who can request for amendment to the constitution. However, if there are some amendments which affect the federal principles, a ratification of half of the states is essential. But other than that, it's not like they can particularly request for an amendment. In United States, however, the states actually have equal power in respect to amendment of the constitution. So that kind of equality and equal division of power is actually, according to some political scientists, makes United States a truly federal nation, whereas India is signified as a quasi-judicial system or a rather a unitary system, a federal system with a unitary bias. So in that sense, we see some amount of differences in terms of the federation of India as far as uh, comparison with United States is concerned. And finally, we have the US Constitution with respect to providing a role to the states in terms of ratification of international treaties. So here, even though the center 
in in United States kind of agrees to or signs a particular international treaty, you have an important role that is being given to the states with regards to ratification of those treaties. As far as India is concerned for the implementation of international treaties, if the states have to comply in some way or the other, then it is obligatory upon the states to agree to it. So this is a major again difference between the way in which the center kind of decides for the entire country in India. All right, and the states are kind of made to look on specific domestic matters within the state. For larger perspective and issues, it is kind of understood that the center will have greater wisdom and an understanding of the entire country rather than only a particular state. So these perspectives, the historical background and the present society today, which form the United States and the Indian society and government, are an important reason for either the similarities or the differences between the two nations. And in that perspective, you need to study this particular topic. I hope you've liked it. Let us know by liking the video. Thank you so much.